I set myself a goal this year to read a book from every single country in the world to try to get myself out of my Western perspective as a Canadian reader. Of course, there are a lot of countries in the world and it's probably gonna take me a couple years to actually complete this goal. But I thought it would be fun to kick this off with a bit of a simpler version. Instead of reading one book from every country in the world, reading one book from every continent. Disclaimer before we continue, no one book can represent an entire entire continent's experience, it's just not possible. So while I tried to be thoughtful in my selection, my choices aren't perfect because the perfect pick from every continent doesn't exist. I'm so excited, so let's not waste another moment. Let me introduce to you the seven books that I picked for this challenge. Representing Africa, specifically Nigeria, I chose Things Fall Apart by Chinua Achebe. Things Fall Apart is known by many as Africa's most loved novel, and it tells two intertwining stories focused on a single character. One is told in a form of an ancient fable, and one is a modern story, and these twin dramas harmonize to create the larger narrative of the story. I've heard amazing things about this author, about this book, and I'm really excited to dive in. The next book is representing Antarctica. And let me tell you, I did a lot of research. I tried to find books written by people who were actually born in Antarctica because there have been a couple people throughout history born on the continent. But as far as I could tell, and I could be wrong, let me know in the comments if I missed something. But through my research, I was unable to find any books written by those few people who were actually born in Antarctica. Finally, I came across this book, Endurance, Shackleton's Incredible Voyage, written by Alfred Lansing. This is a really famous story, a famous expedition, and as far as I could tell, this version of the story by Alfred Lansing was the best version out there, although there is a version written by Shackleton himself. By all accounts, it's not written nearly as well, so I decided to go with this one. Again, it's sort of like a bonus partially applicable book for this challenge, but I really did want to read something that took place in Antarctica. And this is the story of a real expedition in 1914, where Shackleton and his men had to survive on their ship trapped in the ice flows for 10 months before having to abandon their ship as it was crushed and take a lifeboat over 850 miles to the nearest inhabited island. Next up, representing Asia, specifically Iran, I have Persepolis, The Story of a Childhood and the Story of a Return by Marjane Satrapi. I've actually owned this copy of this book for months and months and months. And finally, when this challenge occurred to me, I realized this was the perfect time <laughs> to read this book. This is a memoir in comic strip form and I've heard really amazing things and I'm excited. Next up, representing Oceania, specifically Australia, we have The Yield by Tara June Winch. In a race against time, a woman must confront her past to save her family's future in this story of love, loss, and resistance. Told in three masterfully woven narratives, The Yield is a powerful reclaiming of indigenous birthrights and an offering of hope for the future. So I am very excited for this one. I've heard incredible things about this story, so hopefully I love it. Next, representing Europe, specifically Spain, I have The Shadow of the Wind by Carlos Ruiz Zafón. I have meant to read this book for so long. It's been on my TBR for forever, and I'm constantly having it recommended to me in my comments. Just like Persepolis, it's one of those ones where I really want to read it, and there's no particular reason why I should keep putting it off, but I just have. So I finally decided this is the time, this is the challenge, and I'm very excited for this one. I am expecting to love it, so hopefully I do. The Shadow of the Wind takes place in Barcelona, in 1945 and is apparently an epic story of murder, madness, and doomed love. Stephen King thinks it's one gorgeous read. And while I've never read anything by Stephen King, he seems to know what he's talking about when it comes to books. <laughs> so ringing endorsement. Next from North America, specifically the land now known as Canada, I am reading Love After the End, an anthology of two-spirit and indigiqueer speculative fiction edited by Joshua Whitehead. This is another one that I've had on my bookshelf for a really long time and been excited to read. I'm a big fan of anthologies of speculative fiction. Sci-fi and fantasy are my favorite genres to read and I love a good short story. So I'm very excited to read this one, especially because these stories are written by indigenous authors. Love After the End demonstrates the imaginatively queer two-spirit futurisms we have been dreaming of since 1492. It sounds awesome. Okay, and last but not least, representing South America, specifically Brazil, the posthumous memoirs of Bras Cubas by Machado Diasis. 
This novel is considered the author's masterpiece, and it was written in 1881. In this novel, the ghost of a decadent and disagreeable aristocrat decides to write his memoir. He dedicates it to the worms gnawing at his corpse, which gives you an idea of the tone <laughs> of this book. It is said to be wildly imaginative, wickedly witty, and ahead of its time. And again, I've been meaning to read this for months at this point, so now is the time. So here are the seven books I'm reading for this challenge, one for every continent. And hopefully you're as excited as I am to go on this little journey around the world. So because this is the book that's been on my TBR the absolute longest, I'm going to start this challenge by reading The Shadow of the Wind. And to help me get through these books a little bit quicker and to help me to absorb the material even deeper, I am going to be listening to the audiobook version while I read whenever possible. And to help me do that is this video's sponsor, Audible. Audible offers an incredible selection of audiobooks across genres, including new releases, bestsellers, classics, literary fiction, mystery, memoirs, and more. As an Audible member, you'll get one free audiobook per month, as well as full access to the Plus catalog, which includes select audiobooks, podcasts, Audible originals, sleep tracks, guided meditations, and more. You can download or stream included titles whenever you want. Audible makes it super easy to listen to audiobooks while you're doing chores or maybe on your commute, and Audible is the number one reason why I'm able to get through more than 100 books a year. Go to audible.com slash plant-based or text plant-based to 500-500 to try Audible free for 30 days. Thank you so much to Audible for sponsoring this video, and now I'm gonna hop into The Shadow of the Wind, pop on Audible's audiobook version of the book, and get started on this challenge. So let's go. Okay, so I just finished the first two books for this challenge, The Shadow of the Wind and Love After the End. So let's start with The Shadow of the Wind, since this is the one I started with. So this was the book that I was reading from Europe, specifically Spain, and I loved it. This book has all of the gothic, dark academia vibes you could want, and those vibes were impeccable. This book is all about books and authors and libraries and bookstores and mystery and intrigue and murders disappearances. This book really delivered and I'm so glad because it has been recommended to me by so many of you so many times that I was mildly terrified that it wouldn't live up to the hype. But y'all were right. This story takes place in Barcelona, predominantly in the 1940s, and the story is centered around this mysterious figure, Julian Carax, who is an author of a book called The Shadow of the Wind, which our protagonist, Daniel, finds in the cemetery of forgotten books. And and he finds the story and he tries to learn more about this author and finds that there's so little to be found. And as he tries to find out more about the author, he tries to find more of the author's books. He learns that there is this mysterious man who has been hunting down Cadax's novels and burning them. And this mystery piques Danielle's interest and launches him into this investigation where he teams up with a variety of incredibly entertaining, really interesting and engaging characters to try to learn what he can about Cadax and why his books are being targeted. As I said, this book, the vibes are immaculate. It is so atmospheric, like a cold rainy fall night on cobbled streets in 1940s Barcelona with a stranger on the corner in the shadows smoking a cigarette and the smoke is just wisping by as you make your way between the buildings that seem to lean towards you. It just has all of those vibes. I loved all the characters except for the characters that I meant to hate. 
those characters I hated with my whole soul. <laughs> the characters you're meant to love, I really did, especially Fermin Romero de Torres. He was the best. He made me laugh so many times and was such a good sidekick for our protagonist, Danielle. The story is predominantly Danielle trying to solve this mystery of Julian Carax, but, but it has a lot of other themes and subplots kind of weaving in throughout the story, including forbidden love, grief, and loneliness, and the meaning of family and belonging. And yeah, I'm just a big fan. A big, big fan. I would highly recommend if you haven't read this yet. I'm gonna pop my book card up on the screen now so you can see the trigger warnings that I made note of. I may have missed some, but these were all the ones that I noticed as I was reading. So definitely keep those in mind before hopping into this book. But for me anyway, I thought this was fantastic. I loved it. I'm going to keep reading in this series and thank you to every single one of you who has recommended this book to me over the years. I finally took your recommendation to heart and I'm so grateful. And I don't think I could give this anything other than five of Julian Carax's missing and burnt to ash novels out of five. You should definitely read this if you haven't already. So far, this challenge is going extraordinarily well. <laughs> I also finished Love After the End, an anthology of two-spirit and indigiqueer speculative fiction edited by Joshua Whitehead. Love After the End is representing North America, and this is an anthology of short works of fiction by Indigenous authors who identify as indigiqueer or two-spirit, with a focus on apocalyptic speculative fiction or Indigenous futurism, which was inspired by the Afro-futurism movement. And this is the second in a series of queer Indigenous anthologies that I've read recently. Last year I read Love Beyond Space and Time, an Indigenous LGBT sci-fi anthology edited by Hope Nicholson. I was really excited to get into this one, and I will say I really, really enjoyed this. As I always say when I talk about anthologies, I find them very difficult to review or rate as a collective because each story is its own little world contained, especially in an anthology that is speculative fiction or science fiction. They often take place in completely different versions of our world or on other worlds. There were some stories that really stood out to me. I'll put my three favorites on the screen here in case you've read this anthology or plan to so you can compare your favorites to mine. Leave a comment down below if you have read it. I'm very curious what your favorite stories were. But generally as a whole, as a collection, I really enjoyed this anthology. It was difficult to read for sure at times. Most of the stories are set in either an apocalyptic or post-apocalyptic world. And for the most part, the focus is on the destruction of the planet due to climate destruction, which is not surprising. <laughs> but as someone who has a lot of anxiety about potentially living through an apocalypse <laughs> caused by environmental destruction. It was very difficult to read. I found myself getting very emotional and upset reading descriptions of an earth that has been completely destroyed. And that's definitely something to keep in mind going into this and something that I didn't find quite as much with this anthology. It didn't feel like there was quite so much of a sort of hyper focus on climate destruction, which is not to say that one is better than the other, by any means. It's just something that I noticed and that I found very difficult while reading. So what I did was read one story at a time and take some breaks in between just to try to not to inundate myself with these stories about the world falling apart because it's scary and stressful and it's something that we're facing in real life. So that definitely was difficult. And there's also quite a bit of homophobia, transphobia in these stories, violence, discrimination, pain and suffering and loss. Even the stories that have happy endings are not happy all the way through. So it's not what I would call a pick-me-up. <laughs> and interestingly enough, the final story in this collection, which is Eloise by David A. Robertson, reads to me like essentially a sequel to one of the stories in this anthology written by the same author that was called Perfectly You. So if you've read this anthology, you might be curious to pick this one up in general, because I think if you enjoy this one, you'll also enjoy this one, but also because there's essentially a sequel or a continuation of one of the short stories in this collection, 
and this one. So I thought that was cool. At first I was confused and wondered if I had already read the story. <laughs> so I would definitely recommend this anthology. I did want to read one paragraph from the introduction written by the editor, just because I feel like it does a really good job of describing sort of what this collection is about. So Joshua Whitehead says, originally the project was designed to be geared toward the dystopic, and after careful conversations we decided to queer it toward the utopian. This, in my opinion, was an important political shift in thinking about the temporalities of two-spirited, queer, trans, and non-binary Indigenous ways of being. For as we know, we have already survived the apocalypse. This, right here, right now, is a dystopian present. What better way to imagine survivability than to think about how we may flourish into being joyously animated rather than merely alive? I thought that was beautifully written, and I also thought that that very clearly got across the mission statement of this anthology. It is about rebuilding on the ashes of an apocalypse, tending to the seedlings of a utopia. And while I wouldn't call most of these stories or this collection as a whole uplifting necessarily, many if not all of the stories have that little seed of hope that makes it feel possible that maybe there is a future for humanity somehow, some way. My ratings for each story average out to around four out of five stars, so that's what I'm going to go with here. Four stars for Love After the End. I'll pop up my book card here so that you can see the trigger warnings that I noticed. Keep those in mind. So I've also just started the next two books for this challenge, Endurance by Alfred Lansing, which is representing Antarctica, and Things Fall Apart by Chinua Achebe, which is representing Africa. So once I finish them, I'll be back to share my thoughts. <music> Okay, so I finished two more books, Endurance and Things Fall Apart. Starting with Endurance by Alfred Lansing, representing Antarctica. I expected to like this book, and even thinking that I would like it, hoping I would like it, I was blown away. <laughs> wow. This book includes a bunch of diary entries from the crew, and the author interviewed some of the living crew members about their experiences quite extensively, and it really shows. Reading this felt like being there in the most horrifying way. This is absolutely unbelievable that this happened, that these people survived under these conditions for such a long period of time. I think it was 22 months or something before they were finally rescued, and and just imagine in around 1915 being stuck on an ice floe in the ocean near the Antarctic and trying to survive for years. <laughs> It's honestly mind-boggling, and their experiences were terrifying and heartbreaking and shocking, and yet they still seemed, in so many of these cases, to maintain a certain level of positivity and optimism that was honestly inspiring, because I can't imagine going through something like what they suffered. Just in general, I can't imagine surviving, and the fact that they survived, but not only did they survive, but they stayed hopeful, and they made jokes and they made the most of it and made it through and got to go home to their families. It's just an incredible story and I thought it was really well told, so engaging. I felt so sucked in <laughs> to the story and I was on the edge of my seat, so worried about them the whole time. Every time you think that things are going to get easier or better, something awful would happen again <laughs> to make everything worse, but then somehow they would make it out of that situation and it was really good. So I would highly recommend this story, even if you're not typically someone who would be interested in reading a non-fiction account of an expedition from the early 1900s. It's certainly not something that I've ever read before, I don't think, but this was absolutely riveting and I'm really glad that I read it. And I have to give it five icebergs out of five. Highly recommend. Also, funny story, as soon as I finished this, I texted my parents because I thought both my parents would really enjoy this. And it turns out that my mom got this book for Christmas this past year and loved it. And then my dad read it. And then they've now watched a bunch of like movies and documentaries and TV series about Shackleton and this voyage. So apparently I was late to the party when it comes to my family's appreciation of this story.
also finished Things Fall Apart by Chinua Achebe, representing Africa, specifically Nigeria. And this book focuses on a single character, Okonkwo, who was known as a strong man or a warrior in his tribe, in his village. And we follow his story as he goes from being highly respected and powerful to falling out of favor, to returning and fighting for that power yet again, only to be destroyed by the white colonizers who have come to the village with their own religion and their own laws and imposed themselves on the local people. And I found the story really interesting on a couple different levels. I think the story of Okonkwo on its own as a man who is so obsessed with his own image, so obsessed with his own manliness or strength to the point that he can't allow himself to be happy or or to live fully, or to have fulfilling and deep relationships with others. He has so much fear that he will be perceived to be weak. It's such a clear representation of toxic masculinity as a concept. So the story's interesting on that level, exploring this character, exploring his journey and sort of his internal monologue and his struggles. But it also has that larger view of colonization and the introduction of Christianity into these villages, how it impacted the societal and familial structures within in these villages, as well as the imposition of laws and punishment from outsiders onto people who never asked for it, who didn't opt into the system. And it really shows in such a straightforward and poignant way how destructive colonization is and how nonsensical it is on so many levels and how that colonization rots the communities from the inside out in a way that mirrors how Okonkwo's life is rotting from the inside out. For me, this was a solid four out of five stars. Definitely very glad I read it. So I have three more books to read for this challenge, and I've actually started all three of them. I've read about a chapter of each just so I could get a bit of a taster and see which one I wanted to pick up next. So I'm going to work on all three of these, my books representing South America, Asia, and Oceania. And I'll be back here once I finish these to give you the final update. All right, I finished the last three books for this challenge, so I'm gonna talk through all three of them. Starting with the posthumous memoirs of Bras Cubas by Machado de Assis, representing South America, specifically Brazil. This book was written in 1881 and it was hilarious. <laughs> this is a dead man who is writing his own memoir from the grave as a ghost over a hundred short chapters where he tells about his life and his death, his journey through philosophy, coming to terms with his own humanity. This book contains biting commentary on Brazil at the time, classism, racism, political movements, all told through the lens of the protagonist, Bras Cubas, who is an incredibly unlikable character, but in a very likable way. <laughs> he is intolerable in so many ways, he is self-centered, self-important. He doesn't work a day in his life, but has everything he's ever wanted. He is completely unaware of other people's lived experiences or suffering, overdramatic, pompous, all of these things. But he's also so witty and sharp and wry in the way that he tells his own story. There's little inklings of self-awareness sprinkled throughout that kind of redeem him a little bit in the eyes of the reader. I just really enjoy this. I was surprised by how funny I found it and I'm really, really glad that I read it. So I give The Posthumous Memoirs of Place Cubas by Machado de Assis five earthworms gnawing at a corpse out of five. <laughs> Now, 
Next, I finished Persepolis by Marjane Satrapi, representing Asia, specifically Iran. And this is technically two volumes of this memoir put into one. And as I mentioned at the beginning of this video, this is a memoir told in comic strips. So, so the story of Marjane's childhood and evolution into womanhood is told throughout these comic strips. And I have a lot of mixed feelings about this. On the one hand, I'm really glad that I read it. I felt that it was very eye-opening, very much a window into the experiences of women in the 80s and onward in Iran and the political movements, the religious movements, and how drastically citizens' lives changed over a relatively short period of time. The upheaval, the rebellion, and the suffering. I am very grateful to have read it for that. I really feel like I was able to to gain a lot of perspective and that is worth its weight in gold. And I did really enjoy the format. I thought the illustrations were really evocative and I felt very much pulled into the story through this comic strip format, through being able to see the imagery of what was happening, but in sort of a heightened cartoon way that kind of helps to tell the story of destruction and death and war in a way that isn't graphic, but still gets across the horror. So there's definitely a lot that I appreciated about this memoir, but I will say that Marjane herself throughout the entire memoir was very difficult to like. And I hate to say that because this is her story and it was not an easy one by any means. She went through so many difficult things that I couldn't even begin to imagine, but there were so many moments of her cruelty towards others. This memoir went from when she was around, I think, seven or eight at the beginning through to her early 20s at the end. And I certainly hope that she, as a person through her life, has grown to be a more compassionate and kind person to those around her. But I definitely struggled with that because I wanted to root for her and the whole story is centered on her experience. This is her story and you're seeing all of her lived experiences through her eyes. But I found it so hard to connect to her at times because she would just be so deeply cruel. But despite that, I am really glad that I read this. There's a quote on the back from Zadie Smith that really resonates with me. In her bold black and white panels, Satrapi eloquently reasserts the moral bankruptcy of all political dogma and religious conformity, how it bullies, how it murders, and how it may always be ridiculed by individual rebellions of the spirit and the intellect. And I feel like that's such a good summary of what this is. This is the story of Marjane's early life, but it's also her own personal rebellion against the religious religious extremism and the political dogma of her home and the ways that it harmed not only her personally and her own family, but an entire nation and an entire region of the world. I think for my own personal enjoyment, I would probably be sitting around a three out of five on this one, but I think because of the importance and the sharpness of the political commentary, of the religious commentary, I have to bump that up to a four out of five. It's very poignant, very clear cut and blunt in the way that it addresses the injustices of the misuse of political and religious power. So definitely glad I read it. And the last book that I read for this challenge was The Yield by Tara June Winch, representing Oceania, specifically Australia. And this one I finished just before filming this part of the video. And I must admit, I was wiping away tears <laughs> to try to be camera ready for this part of the video. This book hit me right in the gut in about a million ways, and I thought it was incredible. It shares a lot of similar themes to Things Fall Apart by Chinua Achebe. They both are exploring the experiences of native peoples who are on the receiving end of colonization by white settlers, especially those who are bringing Christianity along with them and imposing their own rules and laws on the local people. 
And the yield is told in sort of three intertwining narratives. One is the story of August, who is a young woman who has, who left home to go to England to escape the pain of her childhood, who has returned because her grandfather has passed away and is reconnecting with her family and the land. The second is a series of chapters written by her grandfather, which are written out in the form of a dictionary where he writes the English word and then translates the word into his traditional language and then defines it through a short story of his life or experiences, or in some cases musings on his lived experiences. And those chapters were my absolute favorite. I found myself tabbing so many of his dictionary entries and just being deeply moved by a lot of the snippets of his life and his inner thoughts and feelings and his perspective. And the third series of chapters are in the form of letters from a white German reverend who has moved to Australia in the late 1800s to establish a church to convert the locals to Christianity and his experiences with the local people. And he's writing these letters in the hopes of reconciling his own mistakes as he's realized what he's done and how he's contributed to the destruction of a civilization, essentially. We alternate between these three stories as August comes into her own and solves mysteries from her past and reconnects to the person she had left behind. We learn more of her grandfather's story through those diary entries and learn more about their people's history through the letters from the reverend. And they all come together in the end in this epic way that I am not going to say anything about because I don't want to spoil it because I definitely think that as many of you as possible should go read this book. But I was emotionally destroyed by the end of this book and I found it absolutely beautiful and so well written. Just a beautiful combination of a personal story, a story of a particular family and their pain and their love and their roots in the land, but also a larger story about Australia as a whole and the indigenous peoples of Australia as a whole, the pain and the generational trauma that was inflicted upon them by the white settlers, by colonization. So this book blew me away and 100% five out of five stars just an incredible read. And as I said, you should read this book 100%. Please do. Beautiful. So these are the seven books that I read for this video, one for each continent. And I'm so glad that I did this video. I feel like my brain and my heart have grown 10 sizes over the course of making this video. I feel very lucky that all of you have recommended so many amazing books from all over the world because this was an incredible selection. I also tabbed the heck out of them as per usual. Very satisfying. Just generally deeply enjoyed this experience. I have found it very humbling and I'm super excited to keep reading books from every continent and slowly working towards my goal of reading a book from every single country in the world. If you made it all the way to the end of this video, give this video a like and thank you. Leave the emoji of your country's flag in the comments so I know where you've come from and so I know you made it to the end. I appreciate you so much. I'll link in the description box a blog post that I've put together with every suggestion that y'all have given me for books to read from every country in the world. These are all taken from my reading journal video from a couple months back where I mentioned that I wanted to read from every country in the world and asked for your suggestions. So I wanted to put that out as a resource for all of you because I was so blown away by how many suggestions y'all were giving and I didn't feel like it was fair to hoard this list for myself. So that is there for you if you want to refer to it, if you're looking to do your own challenge of this kind. If you want to give me some more books I should check out from your country or any country that you've enjoyed, leave those in the comments down below. I'm going to finish this video. Thank you so much again to Audible for sponsoring this video. Go to audible.com slash plant-based or text plant-based to 500-500 to get Audible for free for 30 days. Thank you as always to my patrons for your support. Y'all are the best, my absolute favorite people to talk books with. And with that, I'm going to get going. Thank you so much for taking this journey around the world with me, and I'll see you really soon in my next video. Bye friends.